Thank you, thank you, Dr. Day. It's really a wonderful pleasure to be here. I was very excited and pleased that you and Sally and others here in the Stanford team invited me to participate. I think you're in for a treat today and tomorrow. I think it's going to be uh, wonderfully exciting and just as exciting as it has been for all of us who have been working in this area for a very long period of time. So my, my challenge is to, uh, as Dr. Day said, review just the first 128 years of this disease, and you have 30 minutes to do it, so, so don't feel rushed. Uh, but uh, since many of you are familiar with the disease, I think it'll be somewhat like bringing coals to Newcastle, and uh, it'll just be relearning what you already have known. Uh, I don't have any conflicts to uh, declare. Uh, I have no special disclosures relevant to this talk, but, but I do want to remind Dr. Day that in the memorandum of understanding that he and I signed last year that uh, Sally Dunaway Young needs to return to Columbia by 2023 at the latest as such. So just keep that in mind, John. Uh, so all right, here we are 128 years ago. Uh, and there were a couple of reports that get a lot of credit in retrospect, certainly in a historical sense. The first by uh, Verdnick in 1891, and the second in uh, 19, 1893 by Hoffman. And, and they're credited with describing this entity perhaps for the first time, although if you prowl through the old literature, you'll always find that somebody actually had said something about whatever it is we're talking about, but never got appropriate credit for it. Uh, but uh, Verdnick and Hoffman do get credit initially for bringing this to the attention of the medical profession. And it may be debatable as to whether they truly describe the most severe phenotype, which is typically what Verdnick Hoffman refers to, type 1 spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, and uh, you can see later on, over the first 100 years or so, that uh, our predecessors spent their time trying to understand the phenotypes, the clinical phenotypes that were emerging. So we had Verdick and Hoffman describing it uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and then in the mid 20th century. We had a description from the Scandinavian group, Kukelberg, Weylander, but also Fex and Eliasson uh, also at the same time wrote a paper on the same subject. But unfortunately, they don't get any recognition in the literature, but we should bring that to your attention. And the kukelberg weylander type is the milder type, the type 3 disease. And then increasingly, it was clear that there was an intermediate form between the most severe and the mildest. Uh, and uh, Victor Dubowitz, among other people, get credit for bringing that to everybody's attention. And it's often referred to as the Dubowitz type. And so about a hundred years after this all started in the clinical literature, there was a meeting convened in 1991 to try to make some sense out of this. And I want you to understand that over this period of time, there was a continuing debate going on as to whether uh, all of these three different phenotypes, actually four, uh, are they all really the same disease? and just have different manifestations for some reason? Or are they actually different diseases, at, certainly at the genetic level, and they overlap with some similar clinical findings as such? And as you see here in 1990, a very important paper was published by the Columbia Group with Conrad Gillum and his colleagues, and later by the French group with uh, Judith Milkey localizing the candidate gene for spinal muscular atrophy to a region on chromosome 5 on the long arm, 5Q. And it turns out that the severe phenotypes, the intermediate phenotypes, the mild phenotypes, all seem to localize to this region. 
And so at the meeting in 1991, they felt that this was probably an allelic disorder we were dealing with rather than a non-allelic disorder, uh, and that there was a big spectrum for reasons that remain somewhat unclear at that point in time. And this video shows you some of those classical features. So you can see the young infant uh, on your left, who, uh, if you look carefully, has just tiny little movements, and they're all distal in the fingers and occasionally with the ankles and toes, uh, whereas the child in the center is able to sit, but just barely so. So she's rather severe as a type 2. Uh, and then on the right, you have two children, a boy and a girl, uh, who are getting around pretty well, but they clearly have some weakness. Uh, and the weakness is reminiscent of what you would think with, with muscular dystrophy. And I would say early on uh, in the 20th century, most of these children were in fact thought to have probably muscular dystrophies. And occasionally you'd find that their serum creatine kinase values were actually quite elevated, not only in the hundreds, but in the low thousands as such. And you can see that they have proximal weakness uh, related to limb girdle, uh, and both the pelvic girdle and, and also the shoulder girdle. Uh, and when they get up from the floor, they clearly have what's called a Gower's sign, uh, which is a measure of uh, pelvic proximal weakness, not necessarily diagnostic of either a myopathy or a neuropathy as such. Uh, and so this, now to try to date the onset of these conditions, I, I submit is always very difficult and creating a classification on the basis of onset is always uh, fragile and, and usually doesn't work out well. So here it's defined by the highest point of achievement in motor development. So the non-sitter on your left, the sitter in the middle, and the walker to your right. Now they may lose that ability, the sitter may no longer sit after a period of time, or the walker may lose the ability to ambulate after a period of time, but it's the highest point of achievement in the early neurological growth and development. And of course, you can see the puzzling here when you look, for example, at the muscle biopsies, which we don't do an awful lot of these days, but back in the older days, we did them all the time. And you'd see in the more severe phenotype, a, a sea of denervated small fibers, pycnotic nuclear clumps, and an occasional large kind of type two fiber uh, that is almost diagnostic of, uh, of uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And then on the right, an entirely different pattern on the muscle biopsy. You have really, most of the muscle fibers look pretty healthy, but they're clumped together. So you have two groups that are clumped together rather than a kind of a patchwork quilt. Uh, and so uh, you have something that looked more like a chronic denervating disease with collateral re of the denervated fibers, so that you capture all the fibers that are innervated by the same axon, and that of course defines the histochemical characteristics of the muscle fiber. And then you have some of these large targetoid cells, as you see here, which are essentially diagnostic of neuropathic processes as such. So very different muscle biopsies uh, in terms of their histochemical appearance uh, when you look at these different types. So, we had the idea that the candidate gene was localized to the long arm of chromosome 5 by the work that was done uh, in 1990 and 91. Uh, and then in 1995, uh, in fact, the group in Paris, Judith Melke's group, found the gene. Uh, and here it is, more or less. Uh, and you can see here that we have not only one gene, but two genes. So we have the SMN1 gene, which was called SMNT for telomeric at that time, and the SMN2 gene, or SMNC for centromeric. Uh, and the SMN2 gene is an inverted duplication of the SMN1 gene because of the relative genomic instability of this region on chromosome 5. Uh, and you can see that the SMN1 gene, the SMN2 gene are nearly identical. They have anywhere from, say, five, and some people say as much as 15 nucleotide differences, but only one really counts, and that's on, on uh, 
position six in exon seven, the C to T transition. And as a result of that, that influences the splicing of the pre-messenger RNA that is converted to messenger RNA. And as a result, you end up with exclusion of exon seven in the messenger uh, MRA about 90% of the time when you generate the, the product uh, of the gene. So we have a truncated form of SMN, which is rapidly degraded in the cell, and you're left with perhaps around 10% of full-length uh, SMN protein from the SMN2 gene. Now, the important thing to know is this only occurs in the humans. So we don't have a non-human spontaneous model for SMA. You have to make it. So you take the human SMN2 transgene and insert it into the mouse genome. And then depending on the number of copies, you can have a severe form, so-called Delta-7 mouse model, or milder forms. Or if you put in enough copies, uh, then you can compensate for the disease-causing mutation affecting the SMN1 gene as such. So this is just recapitulating what I said. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, but you'll see here that in the human, if you've not got the SMN1 gene, and you have some copies of the SMN2 gene, and I remind you that perhaps 5 to 10% of us sitting here don't have any SMN2 genes, so the the good news there is that we, if our partner also is in the same situation, uh, won't have any children with SMA. You have to have the SMN2 gene to negotiate fetal development. And then you'll have uh, the uh, phenotype postnatally, depending on how many copies of the SMN2 gene you have. And this has been shown by a number of studies. This is the one frequently referred to by the group in Germany, Feldkotter and uh, colleagues, published in 2002, showing that if you have SMA1, you, you have typically uh, a certain number of SMN2 copies, typically two, as you see here, but you might have only one, or you might have as many as 13, or in the recent publication by Mercury and colleagues, in fact, they found that some type ones actually had four copies less than, far less than 1%. But nevertheless, it shows you that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between SMN2 copy number and severity of the phenotype. And the same kind of story with the type 2 and the type 3. So in type 3, for example, most of them have four copies or three copies. Uh, and in type 2, you might have three copies as such. And this is instructive in understanding the phenotypic severity of the condition. So because of this observation, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, SMN2 gene immediately emerges uh, as a therapeutic target. Uh, and that's exactly what the people after 1995, when the gene was discovered and the SMN2 gene was also found, came to realize, and so people like Adrian Craner and Frank Bennett at Ionis and a number of other brilliant uh, scientists realized that, you know, this is really a disease that's affecting RNA biology and the splicing of pre-messenger RNA to messenger RNA. So the scientists who were studying this for long periods of time and not understanding whether there was any clinical application for their basic scientific work, came to realize that this is just, it's just a golden opportunity to really investigate this and find out precisely what's going on. And so SMN2 gene became the focus of attention in developing a therapeutic strategy. So let me go through just a couple of teaching points here. I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but first to emphasize what I've largely been uh, referring to in my discussions with you, and that is that the phenotype itself is continuous. And it's kind of like, you know, we're all different, actually. I can look at you, and you all look a little bit different. Nobody looks exactly the same. And so if, if each of us has a disease, likely we're going to present it somewhat differently. So if I have pneumonia or Dr. Finkel has pneumonia, uh, he might just pass it off and just continue working, and I might be bedridden for a couple of days as such. And so 
we respond differently to illness, and so you can expect that if you've got a genetic disease because of genetic modifiers, you know, it's embedded in our genome, that we will express it somewhat differently and it'll be influenced by a number of factors. And so the phenotypes really, if you carefully examine all of these patients, each one looks a little bit different in a way. You may lump them as type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 as such, but in fact they're all kind of special and different in their own way. So in general, the type 1 is the more severe. About less than 1% of the time it may start prenatally or perinatally, but otherwise it tends to start within the first six months of life to the extent that we can limit, that we can identify onset of disease. That's very difficult in my experience. And then type two tend to develop a little later in infancy, so maybe after six months, up to say 18 months, and then type three generally develops more later than that, over 18 months of age, again in late infancy. Uh, and, you know, if you have type 3A, you tend to present before three years of age. If you have type 3B, after three years of age. And then finally, the rare type 4, which presents usually in early adulthood, after age 21 years or so. Uh, and uh, each of these disorders are milder related to the later onset of the disease. Now, having said that, and I don't have time to go into it, there are a lot of unanswered questions here as to why this is. And it's still, for me, difficult to understand why the biggest challenge is early development. And if you have SMN insufficiency, why don't everybody present early? But they don't. And then when there's a low requirement later on, they seem to present. So that, that is just one of many challenges in understanding what's going on. The other is, you know, what, what bestows the vulnerability to the motor neurons within the spinal cord and lower brainstem? Uh, some are clearly vulnerable and others are resistant. And, and this was shown very nicely here. This is just a brief study showing that the mouse uh, SMA model shows remarkable overlap as it relates to the vulnerability or the resistance of individual motor units within the spinal cord and lower brainstem as such. And you can see this very close overlap in work done by Justin Lee, who was a, a student with uh, Chris Henderson when he was with us at, uh, at Columbia. Uh, and more recently, some elegant work has been done by, again, some of our basic science colleagues in the Motor Neuron Center at Columbia, Olivio Pellizzoni and George Mentis in particular, together with Umrao Monani. And you could see here when uh, Olivio Pellizzoni's group studied uh, SMN deficiency, they noted that uh, there had to be induction of the P53 gene and the targets, downstream targets of the p53 gene uh, as it relates to the motor neurons, and that certain of these motor uh, columns, specifically the medial column, is vulnerable to cell death, whereas the lateral are less vulnerable, not totally resistant, but less vulnerable. It's listed as resistant, but ultimately they're involved in the severe phenotype. So you can see the P53 transcriptional targets downstream are all upregulated up uh, in these cell groups as such. And with further work that they did here and on the next slide, you see that the model of motor neuron death in SMA is linked to whether the upregulated P53 protein can be phosphorylated by the cell. And if the cell can phosphorylate it as it does in the medial motor columns, that leads to death of the motor neuron. If the P53 protein not upregulated, uh, then uh, that motor neuron is relatively resistant to cell death as, as we see it here. And they did some more elegant work published last year showing that with SMN insufficiency, there is in fact a dysregulation of two non-redundant repressors of the P53 gene that lead to the uh, motor neuron death 
in spinal muscular atrophy. So you could see MDM2 and MDM4 are alternatively spliced in the presence of SMN insufficiency, and that leads to upregulation, lack of repression of the P53 gene, so you get upregulation of P53, and then if it can be phosphorylated, it leads to the death of the neuron. So we now have a very good understanding of how this happens and why some cells are vulnerable and others are seemingly rather resistant. And this then helps us understand the distribution of the weakness. It, it isn't really like a neuronopathy or a neuropathy where you have length-dependent disease. So the toes and feet are affected before the fingers and, and certainly before the proximal group. It's the other way around in SMA, and it's in part related to what we're talking about here. And then the pathophysiology of the disease has now been uh, modified as well because of some work by the Mentis Laboratory and others. And so you can see the classical appearance of the neuropathology here, particularly in the lower brainstem, in the hypoglossal nucleus. Uh, and you can see in the normal, you have a number of healthy-looking motor neurons in the, uh, in the hypoglossal nucleus, where it's in the, this, the next uh, panel showing SMA1 baby at autopsy, a virtual disappearance uh, of the motor neurons. They are associated with fasciculation of the tongue and, and loss of bulk in that tongue as such. So, motor neuron disease, but it always puzzled me as a clinician as to why you lose your reflexes early on in a motor neuron disease. Uh, you know, I thought you lost your, motor neuro, your, your reflexes early in a sensory neuropathy, but you tend to retain them to some degree in a motor neuropathy. And here, we're losing them right up front early on, particularly in the severe phenotype. So George Mentis and his group studied this and found that this is a motor neuron disease for the reasons we just discussed. But in fact, it's a disturbance in the sensory motor uh, circuit. And so the driver for this is involvement of the sensory neuron in the dorsal root ganglion, which leads to deafferentation of the motor neuron, as shown here, uh, because of the loss of the proprioceptive synapses that are impinging upon interneurons and motor neurons. And initially, that leads to motor neuron hyperexcitability, which is shown very nicely in the electrophysiological sense, and then loss of motor neuron as the, as the cell dies as such. And this correlates very nicely with what we see clinically. That is, if you have the opportunity to examine a patient every day, particularly with type 1 disease. They, the first time you examine them, they're perfectly normal. The next day, maybe, you examine them, the reflexes are actually a little hyper-reflexic, a little increased. This is uh, not universally known or accepted, but in my experience, it's, it's the case. And then you get loss of reflexes, and that may happen in a few days. But if you take a type 3 patient, this may be dragged out over months, actually. So you'll initially have hyperreflexia followed by areflexia. And this can be explained in part by the model presented to us by George Mentis. This is a sensory motor circuit disturbance rather than a pure motor neuron disease, and that the driver is deafferentation of the motor neuron by the input of proprioceptive synapses on the motor neuron as such. And then finally, the punchline here for all of us is the fact that a drug was finally found that effectively treats this disease. So we went from an untreatable disease to a treatable disease within a short period of time. Really quite fantastic, particularly if you're as old as I am, and I think I'm probably about as old as anybody here as such. Now, how does this work? Well, you can see this is the mechanism of action of the uh, nurse and nurse. Uh, so you've got an imbalance between uh, exon splice enhancer and exon splice suppressor. And here, because of the mutation, that C to T transition in exon 7 that I referred to earlier, you've got a, a, a favorability of suppression of splicing rather than enhancement of splicing. And so 
Uh, that's what's sitting there as a result of that mutation, but it's displaced when you introduce the antisense oligonucleotide, which uh, goes by uh, Watson-Crick base pairing to that region on the intron 7, and therefore prevents the suppressor element from uh, uh, influencing the splicing of the pre-messenger RNA and uh, promoting the uh, exclusion of the uh, exon 7. So here it, it promotes the inclusion by displacing the suppressor element as such. And as a result, you end up making proteins. So you take an SMN2 gene and you kind of convert it into an SMN1 gene. It's just terrific as such. So it, it's brilliant science, and I, I think the scientists get a lot of credit for creating the opportunity for us to treat these patients in such an effective way. So these are some of the factors that influence success. Uh, and uh, let's say, John, I've lost. How, how we, do we have a little more time? A okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still on East Coast time. All right, let me just show you one, a couple of other little points. Here's some beautiful work by the Monani Laboratory, together with uh, Kat Lutz and others at the Jackson Hole Laboratory, uh, Jackson uh, Lab in, in uh, Maine. So what he basically did is created an inducible model for SMN deficiency. So if you induce uh, SMN deficiency early, the outcome is like untreating. Uh, no treatment, so it's like the natural history. If you wait till later, uh, then the patients actually, the animals <laughs> do pretty well as such. And conversely, in the depletion, so if you have a conditional knockout, uh, if you deplete early, the outcome is bad. If you deplete later, the outcome is quite tolerable. So you could see SMN resistance if you deplete at 21 days in the most model as such. And so this leads to this paradigm where you see the, uh, the requirement for SMN is very high during the developmental period and then it drops off quickly in the most model to a low level uh, when you have the need to maintain the neuromuscular junction as such. And that's very much similar to what we see now in the human. So here's a series of studies where patients have been treated. And so you can see the sham on the bottom in the gray where the natural history is dismal with the high risk of dying within the first two years of life, particularly with two copies. Uh, and then the symptomatic patients who are treated and partially rescued, but they remain symptomatic. Uh, and then the two top ones who have pre-symptomatic disease and when treated, if they have two copies, they do quite well. If they have three copies, they really develop normally as such. So it's quite dramatic. So newborn screening is here and encouraged by the series of studies that I just shared with you. Uh, and until 2016, uh, we couldn't get approval for newborn screening because there wasn't clearly documented and effective treatment for this disease as such. And so that's listed here. So let me just give you examples of our Nurture study that was published just this month in Neuromuscular Disorders. You can see three babies here who are seven days, eight days, and five days old and have genetic SMA and are clinically normal. And you can see they're treated early with nurse and nurse. But if they weren't treated, this is kind of the expectation, just recalling what I shared with you earlier today. Uh, and so this is what we might have expected with those babies who have two or three copies when we were treating them. But this is, in fact, the outcome at one to two years of age. The one on the left is two years of age. The one on the right is one year of age. And they're developing normally. And here we are. One year later, they're equally developing normally as such. Uh, and I don't have another year to show you, but I can tell you that the children are now a year older and they're also continuing to develop perfectly normally as such. So that's pretty exciting and uh, we're all enthusiastic. So here we are uh, now 120 years later we had first in human in 2011 in our PNCR network. We, we, we introduced 
uh, nurse and nurse and for the first time intrathecally to a patient in December 2011. 2016, the FDA gave broad approval for the treatment of SMA of all types with nurse and nurse. In 2018, the federal government was so impressed that they then recommended SMA be included in the newborn screening panel, and now we have several states doing that. And finally, this year, as you know, gene therapy has been approved for a limited population, infants presenting in the first two years of life were eligible to be treated with gene therapy as such. So here we are, 128 years later, and, a, and an untreatable disease in the last eight years of the 128 years is now effectively a treatable year. And here are a number of the points that I've just gone over with you before. Number one, SMA is in fact a disease of splicing. The SMN2 copy number modifies the phenotype severity. It's a sensory motor circuit problem rather than a motor neuron problem as such. Uh, and the uh, FDA has now approved Spinraza broadly in 2016, Zolgemsva in for type 1 disease in 2019, and other therapies are emerging, as Dr. Day mentioned to you in the introduction, and newborn screening is increasingly incorporated by several states. I think it's close to 20 states now, and we expect that all the states will be approved in the near future. So, thank you. No new questions online, um, but if anybody has any questions, please come to the mic. Or I don't see my little throwing microphone. We have this cool throwing microphone, but I don't know where it went. It got thrown. <laughs> please. Hi, Mark Nunes, Kaiser. So I'm really exciting to have a, a fifth phenotype treated spinal muscular atrophy. And I'm wondering if you could speculate on that new phenotype treated spinal muscular atrophy and some of the things that we might see down the road. So for example, uh, with SMN being involved with P53 regulation, you know, are we trading death for melanoma and colon cancer down the road? A trade I'd make, but, but is, is, you know, is that the kind of thing that we need to look for in the future? Well, I, I, I don't know that I can answer all your questions, but I can tell you that's exactly the reason we better keep funding this initiative <laughs> so that we can answer all the new questions that will emerge after we so cleverly answered all the previous questions as such. Uh, but you're right, I think newer phenotypes are emerging and there may be other types of implications, as you just alluded to, that might emerge because of the therapeutic interventions that we're involved in. You mentioned upregulation of P53, uh, but also the uh, introduction of gene therapy in a seven-day-old infant, let's say, even if it is with AAV9, which is said to be totally benign and uh, low immunogenicity and non, uh, causes no human disease. The reality is, is that really true? And if you gave it to infants, and also what is the durability of gene therapy under the circumstances? And is it long enough to get them through that period of high SMN requirement? And finally, you know, is this a disease uh, that uh, uh, treating the central nervous system is necessary and sufficient, or is it necessary but insufficient? And we might see weakness developing in the older patient because the muscles are still SMN deficient. Uh, and so do we really need to have systemic therapy? Uh, and a point, let's say, that risdiplam, one might argue, taken by mouth and distributed through the body of the brain, might have a benefit long run that you might not see uh, with the other agents that are being given intrathecally as such. So a lot of questions. I, I don't pretend to have answers for many or any of them, but I do have a sense of urgency that we must go full steam ahead in funding all of this uh, by all of the stakeholders and all of the corporate entities that have the capacity to support basic research in these areas. 
I guess I'd, I'd uh, also be curious about your perspective on another phenotype, and that is uh, the pre-symptomatic infants. You've had newborn screening going in New York. We don't start it in California until mid-June um, is our expectation, but we're already getting somewhat anxious about that. And um, in our experience with Pompeii, for instance, we'll see these kids now who are genetically affected but aren't aren't uh, showing the clinical phenotype, and you mentioned that that you might that you children might look different than the expected uh, type one presentation, and that could cause some confusion amongst clinicians or parents that are reading online of what SMA looks like. I'm curious if if that's actually been borne out in your experience with newborn screening. Yeah. It, it, John, that, that's another, I, I find, challenging issue. Pre-symptomatic, how do we define pre-symptomatic? Right. I mean, what you might call pre-symptomatic and what I might call pre-symptomatic may be exactly the same or might, in fact, be somewhat different. Uh, and so I, I would say, you know, if you are areflexic but otherwise perfectly normal, are you pre-symptomatic? Or how about uh, if you're hyper-reflexic, no. as you were pointing out? And, and I would say in the nurture study, I think I'm at liberty to say this, uh, <laughs> of the 25 infants enrolled in the nurture study around the globe, yeah. uh, three of them were areflexic on entry, otherwise perfectly normal, and one was hyperreflexic, okay. which I was pleased to see because yeah. it kind of helped me make this argument that right. hyperreflexy, as transient as it may be, particularly in the severe okay. phenotype, is an interesting point and supports the mentis concept that this is a sensory motor right. uh, circuit uh, disturbance as such. But also, if we now look at the, uh, the biomarker, the phosphorylated neurofilament right. heavy, those babies that I just mentioned all had very high phosphorylated neurofilament uh, heavy in the, in, the, in the serum and in the CSF mm -hmm. as such. So as a rule, the, t the babies pre-symptomatic with two copies tended to have higher neurofilament uh, than the babies with, uh, is that being discussed later today? Or Dr. Darris, I thought I saw him here. He's an expert in this, so I hope what I'm saying he agrees with, but, but I think. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we have an opportunity for it to come up, and I'm sure now it will. Yeah, so. but, but the point is, what is pre-symptomatic? You know, clinically normal, but the, the neurofilament is uh, 50,000? I mean, that, right. you know, it's, that's, you know, it's pre-symptomatic only because we're rather limited as a clinician well, it's in finding the abnormality. Right, right. It's using the classic definition of what to expect, and obviously we're, we're yeah. moving beyond that. Yeah. So these are all, I think, newer, milder phenotypes yeah. that may have important implications long term. I mean, after 5, 10, 15, 20 years of following these patients, how are they going to perform over that period of time? Are they going to end up in the adult clinic with late onset weakness of some kind? Or right. Who knows? But I, I think right. it's just, you know, it, the story's been wonderful. In the last eight years, we've gone from an untreatable disease to first in humans to now two drugs that are available to be used as treatment, but yet there are a tremendous number of new questions that have emerged yeah. that require continued following. Well, great. I, I think you've set us up well for the rest of the day, so thank you again. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.